Hello and welcome to Adult Music, the podcast with music for the mature mind. And I'm sorry to say, this is not <laughs> the guest episode with the Same Difference podcast. That we thought it would be. Oh, yeah. It's really lonely in here. <laughs> yeah, we're all alone. Without those guys. <laughs> right. Well, that was our plan. And I did I did say if all goes well and all but didn't... I want to say, it is coming up though, so yeah. we're still going to do it. They just had to uh, delay it a bit. So yeah. we gotta, it didn't all go wait. well last week, but yeah. we've got everything lined up. Well, it didn't go at all. We didn't yeah. talk to them, so it's yeah. not like um, you know, we had to some, reschedule. It, it's not like we were recording. Something went wrong. No, no, no technical <laughs> difficulties. Just scheduling. But uh, yeah, we've got a, another date set up for that. So yeah. hopefully, uh, we'll have that out sometime later in the month. Right. And uh, well, since we are all alone <laughs> over here, <laughs> we uh, we had a good night out last night. Yeah, we had a yeah. It's just uh, just the two of us though. Should we need we yeah. need like people to come to Japan and visit us so we can all yeah. go out or something. But yeah, got some nice yakitori. Yeah, we had our usual great yakitori. And then we had yeah. uh, a couple jazz bars. You know, there's a lot of really small bars in Japan, little holes right. in the wall. A lot of them have, you know, music, big vinyl collections. So this one we hit last night, uh, it's been around since 1978. Had a pretty mm -hmm. good vinyl collection there. The uh, young lady working there yeah. gave us a, a business card, but also... A box of matches, not a book of matches, you know, but a box of matches. And yeah. uh, it's got this really interesting old style cover with the slogan, drink now, adult later. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> yes. Adult music, that is. Yeah, so I'm not, we, we drank last night. We're adulting now. Not quite sure what that's supposed to mean, but it, it does mm. look pretty cool. So I'm going to hang on to it. Yeah, me too. I don't know. I get a box. What am I going to use a box of matches for these days, though? You know, <laughs> you don't really need it for anything. I don't smoke or anything, so. Candles or something. Maybe. Yeah, candles, but, you know, incense, I guess. But, you know, I have a lighter for that stuff. I, I have know. some cigars. Once in a while, I'll have a, Ooh. a cigar. You know, nice. Sit outside. Are they Cuban? Oh, yeah, they're Cuban because you can get Cubans in Japan. So Th That's right. Our American mm -hmm. listeners should know that. You can get Cuban cigars in Japan, that's so right. if you come by. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stop by and we'll... Uh, Smoke cigars an adult later. <laughs> as <they say. laughs> anyway, as usual, we're going to bring you a normal episode with six new recordings of classical music and jazz, three of each, and we're going to talk about them. And I've got a little surprise for you in the jazz section, but I'm not going to tell you now. You're oh, okay. Going to find I don't out think later. I even know what it is, so it's going to be a surprise for me too. Hmm. And for all the music that we're going to talk about, you can find links to the recordings. There's Spotify, Apple Music, right there in the episode description. Also, right at the top, you can find the full episode playlist. That's all the music in one place on Deezer, CD quality streaming from France. They've got podcasts too. If you want, you can listen to the recordings and listen to us talk about them all in one place. Now, if those links or the descriptions aren't clear or easy to follow wherever you listen to us, because we're on just about every podcast app out there, you can always come over to our host site. That's podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com. Everything's easy to follow for this and every other episode. And, you know, one of the things I did this summer, Mike, is I made a, started to make a database. That's right. Yeah. All the episodes. So I've got everything in a spreadsheet anyway. Mm -hmm. So I sent you a copy of that. It makes searching for <laughs> what we've talked about much easier. You know, I, I probably should have looked at it before this podcast because the first thing <laughs> I'm going to talk about, I think we've uh, had them before on a Monteverdi right. recording. I should have checked. Huh? Yeah. Oh, well. So it took a few hours of uh, inputting and clicking there, but now we've got everything there and uh, in one yeah. place. Hopefully get it in a more searchable format. Anyway, if you enjoy the podcast, please follow or subscribe wherever you listen to us. Recommend us to a music-loving friend. We're always looking for new listeners. And if you take a moment, write a little review or make a ranking wherever you listen to us. That helps us get listed in the recommendations. We can find new listeners that way. Also, come follow us on our Facebook page. See our handsome faces there. You can see my whiskey collection. And you can leave a message or comment there. I put up a lot of new recordings couple I put up today, I think, as a matter of fact, as they come out in jazz, they may or may not make it to an episode. So if you want to find the latest and greatest recordings, you can always check there for something to listen to during the week. You can also get in touch with us by email directly. Any comments or questions, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is adultmusicpodcast, all one word, at gmail.com. And I did mention this was originally scheduled to be a guest episode with the same difference. That's two jazz fans, one jazz standard. Those guys, AJ and Johnny, they pick one jazz standard for each episode. It comes out twice a month, and they play little parts of each version, talk about the history, what they like and don't like, and they have a lot of fun doing it. 
So if you haven't heard them yet, please check them out. There'll be a link in the description. And at the end of this episode, there'll be a little promo from them. And you can check that out to hear what they're all about. I was also thinking, are you going to promote that uh, jazz bar we went to last night and give the name? Or are you going to keep it a secret so that it doesn't get overcrowded? You got to become my friend first. So. Okay. So you got to come and visit us or we'll take you to this <laughs> yeah. secret location. Okay. Yeah, I, I get that. You don't want to spoil the place, you know? We've yeah. got our uh, secret locations. Uh, we have several of them, yeah. Off so. the tourist trail. That's kind of on the tourist trail, but you might not that find one, that it. That one's on it, but people yeah. aren't going to find that place. It's like in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I guess now they have... Um, what, like Google Maps or something like that, you yeah. just kind of say. But who's going to type in Jazz Bar? I mean, you know, unless it's like what? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. There there were some uh, touristy-looking people in there last yeah. night, though, So just but only two or three. So I don't know how they found the place. I don't know how we found the place. I found it because no, I typed in Jazz Bar. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you're, you're one of the people who would yeah. type in Jazz Any Bar. Places so I haven't uh, visited yet. You know, there's always another hole in the wall you can find. So Yeah, I, you know, a friend, uh, we have a friend in Osaka who would know where all of these places are because he kind of seeks them out. You know? Oh, I forgot one of the most yeah. important things. Yeah. At, uh, not that bar, but another secret bar that I definitely won't tell anyone about uh, uh-huh. who has one of the best whiskey collections in Kyoto. Oh, we went there last night too. Yeah. The one, yeah. We drank the official drink of the Adult Music Podcast. They're Which is now unavailable. Barrel. Yeah, you can't you can't get it anymore. Say, but he still say the has name, it. So. Say the name again. Knob Creek Single Barrel. There you go, because yeah. I talked over you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so... Yeah, we got some Knob Creek single barrel. It kind of yeah. felt like old times. It's uh, they're not making it anymore. I don't know. Yeah, you can't and I think get it in they Japan they anyway, never made so. it in the U.S. It was only like for export, I guess, or mm. something. And we got it here. Yeah, I, don't know. I do have two unopened bottles still. You have so. two unopened bottles. Yeah. You got to save those, I guess, for like an yeah. occasion. When we get famous, yeah, something to save <laughs> like, for. <laughs> when we start making money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if that ever happens, but I don't know. We do have a growing audience though, which is we nice. do. All right, what kind of uh, program we got lined up in the classical department tonight? All right, I got my usual lineup, uh, or my uh, my favorite lineup. Let's say we're not going to do this next. Or yeah, we are actually, huh. kind of. But uh, yeah, this week we've got uh, we've got a baroque. We've got kind of uh, something between the baroque and contemporary, and then we've got a contemporary recording. Do we have a contemporary recording tonight? I we forgot. do. We do. Yeah, that's right. Okay, very good. All right, now, the first recording is the Baroque one, Handel Water Music, and Music for the Royal Fireworks, two very famous Baroque-era yes. pieces. Uh, this one is a new recording by um, B-Rock. <laughs> Baroque, get it? It's B-apostrophe gotcha. R-O-C-K, yeah. conducted by Dmitry Sinkovsky, and this is on the uh, Pentatone label. Now, B-Rock, I think, but I didn't check the database. I have it now. <laughs> I right. didn't look at it. I've got to just look at but, it. But I think we heard them before in a Monteverdi recording, maybe in 2021, okay. with Alyssa Oropesa, Lisette Oropesa, I think, if we talked about it. I don't remember if we did or not, but I definitely heard the album. So I'm, I'm familiar with this ensemble. Anyway, so we have um, just those. And um, the water music is one of my... Uh, when I was in college, this was these two works were among the first um, kind of classical music works that I started listening to. Mm. It's a it's pretty easy way to get into classical music because yeah. they're pretty um, they're festive, easy yeah. on the ear. They're festive. They're kind of you know they're big and they're kind of sound a little old too. Anyway, first was the uh, the water music suite. I have stories about these pieces actually, just because of I'll tell I told one of you. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell one of them later. Anyway, I'll tell you later. Anyway. Um, Water music comes in three different suites. These were written by Handel for the, the King of England, actually. They were going to go out on the uh, Thames. And uh, they, I guess Handel uh, surprised the king by having his uh, bands on boats. And they played this music while they were wow. out on the Thames. I don't know if it actually ever happened, but at least that was the intention. It might have. I can't imagine how sound would carry in that outdoor environment yeah. very well. But who knows? There are three suites, as I said, and this recording begins with uh, water, water Music Suite Number 2 hmm. in D major. So what they did, I don't know why they did this because I, I don't have the CDs, so I, don't, I didn't have any uh, booklet notes for this one. But um, it looks like the second one and the uh, third one are both short, and they kind of act out, I guess, as shorter suites for the big okay. first suite, which is in the middle. I'm, that's just going to be my, my guess. I guess they thought it made a better program. There, there might be some historical reason for it, too. I'm not really sure. But anyway, Water Sweet Music number 2 in D major, HWV 349. Uh, this has five movements, and the first one is really unmarked, but it has an allegro. It's considered to be an allegro. 
It's very bold, which is uh, what we expect from this music. Outdoor Baroque music tends to be really, you know, public and, you know, yeah. it, it's almost like the, the kind of the musical version of somebody giving a speech. You're going to talk in a loud voice, that sort of thing. There's a very fast tempo here, um, which I found appealing uh, mm. enough. It's a clear recording, and the instruments are all clear, too. It's a, it's a transparent recording as well, meaning you can kind of hear through to every instrument. Brass have that uh, period uh, turkey call sound that uh, yeah. Russ, Russ loves so much. Do you like yeah, that those, sound? The turkey horns, yeah. The, the turkey I mean, horns? It's kind of cute, you know, if you haven't heard it on period instruments, yeah. I like it because it's hmm. it's rough, you know, and it just it just kind of sounds a little just the unpolished nature of it. Because a lot of classical music for years and years is what was so exciting about the period instruments movement in the eighties hmm. was that suddenly everything wasn't smooth and shiny. You know? right, <laughs> it, right. it kind of sounded more sort of homemade or you know sort of hmm. uh, DIY. You know, uh, they don't really sound like that anymore. They've gotten pretty slick at this, but uh, here we soon get some of those rough sounds sometimes. Everything um, on the recording also is very lean, and the ensemble is very crisp as well. Right. Some of the brass ensemble playing has that characteristic potential train wreck sound, where <laughs> it sounds like everything's going to fall apart, but it doesn't. Mm. You know, sort of like the Rolling Stones had or something like that. Because <laughs> you're just waiting for it to all go off the rails, and it just never does. Anyway, so this is really great. So it's exciting to hear that, I think. And I mean this in a good way, uh, if they're mm. listening. Uh, there's a silvery harpsichord solo before the second movement, too. And silvery is a good word for the way the harpsichord is recorded mm. on this uh, recording. It's kind of light and thin, kind of gossamer. The second movement, a la hornpipe, uh, has a good blend of instruments. The rhythm is sharply delineated, something I really like when that's done. And this is really a hornpipe is kind of a dance in this case, which features a hornpipe, I guess. It sounds ceremonial, like the king is there. And I'm also noticing stereo effects with the low brass clearly on the left and the high brass on the right. I wonder if they would have done that with the king in the middle and you have two oh, boats possibly, kind of going by yeah. on both sides. I don't know. Strings are also split. There are groups of violins on both sides, and they kind of trade lines. There's a change of material at about the two-minute mark, the B section, and then the A section comes back. Third movement, Menuet, has a beautiful recorder tone. With an appealingly languid shaping of the melodic line, you know, just, mm. just too tired to move. It's a nice feeling, especially now that it's summer, <laughs> which is kind of how I feel. Yeah. Uh, fourth movement, Rigodon 1. This is a dance, and there's some extra metallic percussion on this at the beginning. This is a little surprise, too. Like a uh, something like a tambourine mm. and yeah, wooden sticks. That. I've never heard this on this um, piece before, so they've added a little something. Uh, the melodic material is lively and fast. And then Rigadon 2 and Rigadon 1 da capo. Tracks 4 and 5 are really all the same piece, really, but they've divided the uh, track. The liveliness continues here, and the opening Rigadon comes back with percussion. Easy to tell when it's there. All right, now here we go to the, the piece I know the best, the Water Music Suite Number 1 in F major. This is tracks 6 through 15, so that's how many uh, movements? 10. Pretty long. And there are a lot of really famous themes in this. If you've you've probably heard them, even if you've never heard this piece before, you know you probably heard it in. Yeah, it's pretty you know popular. Yeah, if you've, you're walking by a store or you know maybe you're at a concert once. It gets played a lot. Anyway, it starts with a big overture, and this is really fast. The overture is marked in parentheses largo. Now that's not the tempo marking that Handel used. There's no tempo marking. Largo is kind of slow. The word largo in Italian means wide. So mm. you kind of think, you know, it takes from time, you know, there's something about kind of, you don't want to say lumbering, but some sort of a spaciousness right. to the sound basically is what they're going for. And it usually winds up being slow. And this is, I don't think this qualifies as Largo, <laughs> to be honest. It's really fast. Mm. Um, it loses a bit of its majesty at this speed because an overture is of this type. It's kind of like in a French overture style. And the king would kind of walk into the room, you know, as this type of rhythm is being played. And uh, he'd have to jog in at this speed. <laughs> I don't know. It's melodic and enjoyable, though, and the fugue sounds beautifully at its tempo, each voice registering and sounding chirpy and positive. There's some great violin soloing on this track, too, in the faster fugal section. And the allegro section is properly allegro. It's a good speed. 
Second movement, Adagio Estacato. This is played with strong accents, like I've heard in some Vivaldi concertos. It kind of reminded me a bit of Vivaldi, the mm. way Vivaldi concertos are approached these days. It's an interesting idea for this movement. Um, the oboe solo here melts into the ear like heated wax. <laughs> it's really beautifully shaped. Okay, third movement. This is track eight, uh, marked Allegro in parentheses. It's pretty famous with its brass harmony, and it's played pretty fast here and impressively with everybody together, despite the obvious difficulty of getting these instruments to sound like in tune. I like the rough texture of brass from this period, and at this speed, the string answer to the brass sounds excellent and melodic. The uh, fourth uh, movement, Andante, and then uh, going back to the third movement, Allegro da Capo. So it's really an ABA form. This is pretty quick in its wind-led theme with a harmonized theme and a contrapuntal bass line played by the oboe. Very pretty. The interweaving of the lines at this speed is appealing, and the strings um, take over, and the tempo, still fast, seems to slow a bit. The Allegro comes back and is played at its fairly quick tempo. And there's an odd transition into the cadential material where the tempo suddenly slows. Fifth movement, Allegro, comes across as a jaunty dance. It's got a lot of brass and, again, is given a fast tempo. The quiet brass are really a nice touch here. I really hope they're not playing it this fast to squeeze it all onto the CD because I think it is about <laughs> a little over 80 minutes long. If they would have played it at a slower speed, they would have had to go to a second CD. Anyway, the quiet brass are really a nice touch here. They get a beautiful texture and feeling like they're telling a secret. There's a B section carried by the strings, then the opening section repeats. Sixth movement, air, uh, has a fast tempo. The strings have the theme, which flows like the surface of water with a kind of a wave running through it. Uh, that texture is strongly felt at this tempo, and the legato phrasing works well. Seventh movement, minuet, starts with brass fanfares answered by winds. I like the rugged sound of the period brass instruments here. Uh, the tempo is fast, but it comes across as lively in this movement, so I, I give it a thumbs up. It works well. This has a string-led B section, and I like the exciting, joyful way the A section comes falling in when the B section ends. And there's some great dynamic fortes here, too. Eighth movement, Boré, is a rushing Boré, featuring some tambourine-like percussion in the wind-led section. Ninth movement, Hornpipe is connected to the previous movement in a nice transition. It's fast and lively, and the liveliness works well for the wind instruments, who sound great in harmony. There's a nice blend of sounds. This one has interrupted cadences, and there's a nice quiet landing on the last chord. And finally, the tenth movement, Allegro Moderato, opens with the winds playing the theme in harmony. Uh, strings come in for answers to and echoes of the winds material. I like the way the material winds down. It's a bit quickly played, but not dramatically so. There's a nice forward flow to the lines, strongly felt at this tempo. So they're getting a lot out of the fast tempos. There's hmm. kind of a, a little bit of excitement, some really beautiful shaping of the lines at that speed, kind of makes it a little, gives it a little more electricity. A violin gets a brief cadenza, after which we get a surprisingly heavy, dark sounding cadence to end this. Okay, and then we go to track 16 to 21 is Water Music Suite number 3, the last of the Water Music Suites, HWV 350. This starts lentement, and it starts majestically and nobly, and surprisingly, at the, by this point, at, a, at an appropriately <laughs> slow tempo. This, this sound came out sounding perfect. I was a little surprised mm. by that. This actually is more of a largo, to be honest, but uh, <laughs> they're... They, they are play lentement, it just means slowly. It's fit for a king's entrance anyway, and it might seem pompous, but it should be. <laughs> okay? Mm. King, kings were pompous types back then. Anyway, the uh, track 17, the second movement, is a bore, which is a dance. It has a modestly quick tempo, uh, more in line with what I'd expect again. Uh, mostly brass, and the higher brass play nimbly. We get a bit of that turkey call from the lower brass. It's amazing that these instruments played this type of music back in the day. <laughs> you know, oh, I think I'll write this for the low brass, and people were able to do that. I find that hard to believe. But anyway, they, they don't sound made for the kind of lines that Handel is uh, writing for them. But, you know, we have great uh, professional musicians these days who are highly trained to do this. Anyway, the third movement, the 18, track 18, is Menuet 1. It's a bit quick, but modestly so. The melody is given a nice flow to it by the strings. It's very pretty and has a lovely chiming continuo sound. The harpsichord is the continuo here. Track four, I'm sorry, 
tw- track uh, 19, this is uh, movement four, is menuet two. The second menuet is led by a recorder melody for a nice contrast, and it's also got a nice flow. Then we get track 20, movement five, jig one, and then uh, movement six, jig two are both on the same track. The first jig has a nice leaping feel to its rhythm, and the recorder plays the theme. The second theme features the tambourine shaking sound as the strings are almost at galloping tempo. It comes across as exciting and then suddenly goes into a slowly taking cadence. And the uh, sixth movement, track 21, is a menuet with a modest tempo by the winds who are in the lead. The strings come in for a repeat and a fuller sound. The rhythm has a nice sway to it. It's rather an odd ending to an entire set of water music suites, not really sounding very emphatic. Okay. Next, we get to the uh, music for the Royal Fireworks, HWV 351. And as you might imagine, this is another outdoor piece written for an outdoor fireworks display Hmm. um, back in its time. I don't know if that was successful or not, but uh, I have a little story about this. When I was an engineer in Boston, I think it was um, either the (laughs) Boston, some some Baroque group was playing out on the... uh, the Esplanade in in Boston, and uh, I was working for a radio station at the time, and the radio station decided, it was a classical radio station, they decided they were going to broadcast this uh, music for the Royal Fireworks, and there was going to be a fireworks display. Oh. So the uh, we had a bunch of engineers, they all went out there, and I was in the uh, studio back at the radio station. I didn't get to see the fireworks, so... I missed the only <laughs> the only noteworthy thing about this, although I suppose the music playing was very good too but the problem with the music was that we didn't hear it because the fireworks were so loud <laughs> that all you really heard were <laughs> explosions and the, there was this distant orchestra playing yeah. i don't know maybe the, they couldn't get the mics uh close enough where the fireworks were just too loud and it just didn't work out so anyway, we, we broadcast this on the air and it was like a total disaster and um i remember the next day our chief engineer came and berated us all for our poor performance <laughs> of getting that recording on the air, it, it was ridiculous because it was <laughs> you, it was not possible to hear the orchestra <laughs> over those fireworks. Yeah. Baroque orchestras aren't very loud, right? Okay, mm-hmm. so I felt that was very unfair, and I re-experience that trauma every time I hear music <laughs> for the Royal Fireworks. <laughs> but I think this performance may have healed me a little bit from that experience because it's really probably the best performance of this work that I've heard. And uh, the one I'm really familiar with is the Old English Concert with Trevor Pinnock, which I think is from the 1980s. It's on uh, it's Deutsche Gramophone, but it's their uh, archive. I don't know what it's on now. They might have changed the name of the label. But that one has really big, bold percussion on it. And this one, um, I liked the way the percussion were done. So track 22 is the overture going to an adagio. And it has a bold percussion opening on what I guess would be period timpani. Uh, the opening is very much a regal overture, and the percussion continue to accent the beats. Tempo is appropriately on the slow side here. All is well judged. I even like the balance of the percussion and orchestra, something that kind of bothered me on that old Pinnock um, recording because I felt like the percussion were too loud. But in those days, that, that was when all of this was new, and they were just, you know trying out new things. There's percussion and a fanfare to end this section, which ends on an open cadence and lead into the next section. Track 23, this is still a continuation of the um, the overture. It's faster in contrast to the opening. It's judged well, though, with a lively dotted rhythm that makes the theme lurch forward in an appealing way. The lines that even out figuration and cadences, there are some pretty nice fanfares by the brass in this starting on high brass in the right channel and answered by lower brass in the left channel. Stereo. We need more stereo these days. There aren't that many (laughs) stereo effects, at least in popular music anymore. Mm. There's a slower, because I think people write it for their dinky computer speakers, you know. There's a slower melodic middle section, then the allegro repeats. It's just fantastic all the way through. Track 23. Sample, please. Track 24. Second movement, Bore. This is flowing with a springy rhythm to it. Strings start it, winds respond, and everything sounds great. Beautiful tonal blend. Although it's not, because they're period instruments, everything doesn't blend the way it would in, let's say, a modern orchestra where the instruments are designed to do that. But they do play together well. They get the um, the levels of the dynamics right between all the uh, instruments. It just sounds great. Track 25, movement 3, La Paix, Largo alla Siciliana. La Paix is peace. 
This is a proper Largo tempo. This is the what the first movement of the <laughs> what music suite number one should have been like. So if you want to know what a Largo sounds like, track 25. Combined with the Siciliano, it makes an impression on it had an impression on me. It has a heavy feeling to it due to the wide uh, bass sound at the opening. Uh, nice flow by the B-Rock here and lovely short trills at the end of phrases. The B-Rock is the ensemble's name, in case you've forgotten. Track 26, um, movement four, La Rejouissance. <laughs> How do I say this? Rejouissance. <laughs> Rejoicing. <laughs> Rejouissance. Uh, fanfares at the beginning ring out beautifully and excitedly. The percussion adds energy, too. This is all brass and fairly martial sounding. I love those low brass in the left channel that sound like they're struggling a bit to keep in tune. Always kind of exciting to me. <laughs> the higher right channel brass are very clean sounding, and there's a big bold cadence at the end. I'm very impressed by the high brass on this recording all the way through. Mm. Not to take anything away from the low brass, but, you know, those are more difficult instruments to handle. Anyway, track 27, movement 6, minuet 2, swaying rhythm. Tempo is excellently judged. And the line has energy to it, and the melody and the rhythm bring a smile. And uh, track 28, uh, the last uh, track on the album, Menuet 1, and then um, Movement 6, Menuet 2, both combined onto one track. Track 27 and 28 are Menuet 2, Menuet 1, Menuet 2, and again, I don't know why that arrangement <laughs> was made that way, although Menuet 1 does sound like the, the quieter one, it sounds like it belongs in the middle. They may have all been separate originally. I don't remember. But the middle minuet is played more quietly with a good tempo. The opening repeats. We've got another unexpected ending to the suite. This really is an excellent performance of the Royal Fireworks music. I feel like my old trauma is completely healed now because I was <laughs> smiling while I listened to this. I really enjoyed it a lot. I think I like this better than the old Pinnock recording. This, the Royal Fireworks. It's a bit leaner sounding and uh, not so bombastic with the percussion, although I think I'm kind of over thinking that. I haven't heard the Pinnock recording in a really long time. I should probably, I still have it on my shelf. I should go back and listen to it. So if you're a fan of the uh, Royal Fireworks music, I would check this out. I think it's a great performance. Now, the water music is a, they're good, but they're a different story, all right, because they took a lot of um, chances with the, um, the B Rock have. You know, like the uh, B rockers that they are, have taken a lot of chances with the tempo. There's excellent playing throughout the album. A lot of it's very fast. And for me, those fast tempos are new in this piece. And I think I prefer this music to be a bit more relaxed, the water music I'm, I'm referring to. Uh, not the third suite, which is played at really um, a, what I felt like were appropriate tempos. They just felt good to my ear. At any rate, the speeds draw out some interesting niceties of phrasing, uh, particularly from the strings. Let's see, this is uh, certainly a recording worth hearing, as I said, especially for the excellent playing. Some of the fast tempos, especially in suite number one, were really too fast for my taste, so this really isn't going to be my go-to recording for the water music. I think it will be, though, for the Royal Fireworks. Don't get me wrong, it all holds together well. I'm still going to go, I think, for the, my old Trevor Pinnock recording, which I think might be the only other recording of this that I have. I think this recording is worth having, though, so I would advise you to check it out. Yeah, I thought it was a really good set of performances on period instruments. I have a recording of this on SACD oh, with wow. period instruments as well that I like, and I could tell the tempos were a little bit quicker on the, the works that you mentioned, but I, I enjoyed it. I actually, in total, I enjoyed the Royal Fireworks pieces more I because thought I so thought too. they were more right. exuberant and uh, just had a little more energy. They were exuberant without being too fast, I thought. Yeah. Overall, really good sound on the recording. And I thought the drums were particularly impactful, not overpowering, but when some of those timpani hits come in, they really come yeah. right through. Yeah. And get your attention. So, yeah, yeah they, they didn't sound bombastic, though, like they can. I've heard them sound like that on other recordings. Yes, they don't sound, how can I say, extremely bassy. Mm. They just sound I dynamic. I think I liked that about them, and, though, yeah. And so the the punch on them is really good. Yeah. All right, so a little, uh, so some familiar music for everybody. Yeah. All right, next, on our next um, classical album, we have a new album on the Chandos label. It's also an SACD if you have the equipment, which I do, but I don't have the CD. So I was like streaming this one. This is uh, Overtures from Finland, and this is yeah. by the Ulu Symphonia, conducted by Rumon Gamba. 
I um, did some research on each of these pieces. Um, there's a little bit on the Chandos website about them too, so I kind of checked that out. So this is um, 10 overtures by 10 Finnish composers, all from the early 20th century and maybe the very late 19th century in some cases mm. too. So it's that period, and what a magical period it was in Finland. And I got to tell you, Finnish music has continued to be really great Yeah, it's ever exciting. since. It's still great today. We heard um, the Sadia Ho work, and we're big fans of Eno Ihani Rautavara's music, yeah. a 20th century composer who died um, maybe, jeez, oh, I don't even know now, 10 years ago. Is it 10 years ago now? God, it may be less. I don't know. I don't remember. We've heard some really good Finnish jazz, too. Yeah. Yeah, so. this Finland's a happening place. Yeah. They've even got great heavy metal, apparently. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. <laughs> I've heard. I've heard. They're yeah. still into it over there. Yeah. Oh, they're into it in a big way. They kind of go. Mm. Yeah. We. I met a few of those guys at um, <laughs> one of the places here in Kyoto. I go to. So anyway, I go everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's go through these these ten works. Um, the first one is by everybody's favorite Finnish composer, oh, yeah. uh, Jean Sibelius. Now, if you know Sibelius, we all love the Second Symphony and the Fifth Symphony and really all the symphonies, but those are my two favorites. Anyway, this is an early work, the Corellia Overture, Opus 10. It's the overture to a longer piece called Corellia Music, which we never hear. And we usually just hear the overture. Or there's also a Corellia Suite, and that's the thing we we usually hear when we hear this music. Um, it comes from the beginning of Sibelius's career, written in 1893, so we're still in the 19th century. This has a nice warm sound for the opening of the strings. Right away, I was wishing I was listening on SACD. I would have gotten all that warmth from the recording. Pacing is good, and all the wind instruments are clearly heard in the transparent texture. Uh, the theme that emerges at 245 is a fanfare, heard from far away, and we hear it in more cheerful guise in the winds. The overture is divided into distinct sections that are easy to follow, and Sibelius's melodies are so catchy that you'll recognize them when they repeat. Uh, the ending theme, with its distant timpani, is especially attractive. This is a funny. This is the thing about classic music that's important. You want to, if you're if you're a really great composer, if you can write great melodies, you have a huge advantage because you can, by bringing those melodies back. If you have memorable melodies, people will remember them when they come back, and they'll easily be able to follow the structure, and then they'll just love the whole piece. And mm -hmm. they'll feel really smart, too, because they're following all the music. If you have a more abstract theme, <laughs> those are a little harder to follow. I even find myself saying, did I hear this already? You know, Because <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes they don't really stick. You know, you got to hear a piece a lot of times. Not in the case with Sibelius, who's, got a, who's a great melodist. Anyway, the second track, Uno Klami, 1900 to 1961. This piece is called, I'll just say the English name, The Cobblers on the Heath. There are too many U's in that title. Numisutarit. Numisutarit. Alkusoito, something like that. Double M W. Yeah. I like languages that have like two vowels like together, like A A's or, I don't know. Anyway, Klami, he's kind of closer to European modernism because he studied in Paris and Vienna. And this piece starts out with what sounds like comic energy. It's effervescent and rushing, and there are some odd harmonies in the thematic material that make you smile. It's upbeat and pleasing. I also like the very high violin tones at around 1 minute 23 seconds or just before that. At 2 minutes 15 seconds, a loud, highly energetic pounding theme appears and just as suddenly is arrested as more comic material follows. The orchestration is clever and brings a smile for its comic effects. There's a build-up and sudden pulling back at 5.15, which seems to be the modus operandi of this piece. I like the whole feel of the quickly bowed strings in the sixth minute with the thematic material above. A more spacious comic section follows, and the work has an exciting build-up to its final chord, with an out-of-control violin finally bringing us there and crashing timpani not allowing it to happen until another rushing violin line appears to bring the cadence over the top. Third, Erki Melartin, Princessa Rusunen Overture. That's the sleeping beauty to you, oh. <laughs> my American friends. Mm. This is the overture to his incidental music for um, Zachary Stopelius' fairy tale play at the Finnish theater. It's moody, mysterious strings open the work, creating the enchanting atmosphere necessary for the play. 
The thematic material has a heavy, dark trudge to it. The mm. work gains in romantic intensity as it goes, climaxing at some high, powerful chords. There's a fanfare at 420, bringing us back to Earth, and the piece comes to a quiet end. Track 4, Levi Madatoya. <laughs> Man, this is another one of those mile-long words with a lot of <laughs> vowels in it. His comedy overture, Huvinatel <laughs> Malkusoito. Oh, man. Oh, boy. Anyway, any Finnish people out there can call in and let us know how to say this. <laughs> Opus 53, Levi Madatoya. Perhaps the most talented of Sibelius' small number of private pupils. Um, this work echoes Richard Strauss, and Madatoya was a native of Ulu, which is the orchestra oh, right. that we're hearing on this recording. That's where they're from. We hear the uh, comedy after the ominous opening in the staccato bassoon. The overture starts out with a bit of anxiety. By 115, we've leapt into a bouncy, cheerful theme, beautifully orchestrated, as have been all of the works on this album. The Finns are yeah. great orchestrators, I have to say, yeah. at least in this period. They, actually, that's not true. They've always been, okay? It's um, got that uh, orchestration gift. This really was a golden age in Finnish music. This is a comfortable listen, full of high spirits. At 215, there's a lovely woodland type of winds section that, to my ear, is reminiscent of Sibelius. And the next bouncy, flowing section is heard after the third minute. The sections sort of intermingle the rest of the way through the overture. I like the fanfares just before seven minutes, leading to the unexpected slowing and then suddenly rapid ending. Track five, Armas Yernefelt, Overture Lyrique. He's, he's writing in French here. Hmm. a friend and fellow student of Sibelius, and eventually became his brother-in-law. Huh. All in the family. This starts with a more steady rhythm at the beginning than the previous piece did, and the theme at around the 42nd mark is bold and public and very confident. There's a buildup of tension from 1 minute and 10 seconds on, the dynamics ebb and flow, and the orchestration is appealing, with violins playing a soft, undulating pattern as a bed for the chords and themes. A build-up after the two-minute mark leads us back to the first theme. In the third minute, there's a sort of call in the brass leading to the light section that follows. It builds up. Uh, this overture has a lot of build-ups <laughs> that then taper off. <laughs> and we're hearing familiar music again. By 520, we're hearing the opening material again, I think. This is one of those situations where I didn't remember if I had heard this theme before. It's one of the opening themes anyway. There's a brief tapering off of this. Uh, then we're hearing... We're heading to the build-up to the end, which features triumphant, almost martial figures. A sudden detour into a reed instrument gives a warning call, and an oboe plays a melody that suddenly stops, and we get a bolder build-up to the end, which has a warm, sustained chord. Yeah, I, it's, it's, there's a lot. I shouldn't have. I should have just played it and not put it into words. Anyway, track six, Ernst Milk, dramatic overture, Opus Six. This was one of my favorite works on the album. Uh, Milk, 1877 to 1899. Uh, so that means he died two days before his 22nd birthday. Oh, wow. Yeah. He had consumption, which is the old way of saying tuberculosis, in Locarno, Switzerland. And he was mentored by uh, Robert Kajanus, who also conducted the premiere of his work in Helsinki. Kajanus was the, uh, the leading Finnish composer before Sibelius. This starts mournfully with funereal brass. Strings then come in with a rather sad theme, and winds finish it off. Interesting orchestration. There's a slowly arpeggiated harp that separates the sections. The theme gets louder, full string treatment, after the one-minute mark. And at the two-minute mark, the theme proper starts, with a rather swashbuckling theme. A second theme is heard, after three minutes and 30 seconds, softer and more romantic, and sumptuously orchestrated. The swashbuckling theme goes through some development after the 4.30 mark. Then, in Quiet Guys, after 5.20, we hear dramatic segments of it with warning brass signals. At the 8-minute mark, we're hearing two themes juxtaposed over each other in some clever and appealing orchestration. Miel gets a lot of warmth out of the orchestra in his fortissimo sections, and the orchestra puts these across well. The ominous build-up to the end after the 10th minute sounds fantastic, with the timpani rolls and ending in a splash gong. I like that splashing gong. Uh, full orchestral sound leading to the end. There's a fantastic false cadence right around the 11-minute mark, after which a taut, stunned, quiet theme iterates the last phrases. It's a really great piece. 
a highlight for me on this album. Sample that, track six. Track seven was the other piece that I really liked on this album. Well, I liked them all, but these were my two mm-hmm. standout ones. Selim Palmgren, whose music I'm very interested in. I've heard a lot of his piano works. Tukimo Sarya Overture. Um, he was an acclaimed pianist and composer and was eventually appointed professor of composition at the Eastman School of Music in the USA. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How about that? This is from the uh, Tukimo Sarja the Cinderella Suite. It's exotic, and it starts with sparkling string orchestration. You know, I'm thinking I really should have sampled this because you're going to do some music samples tonight. This would have been a good thing to hear. And a wind chord. There are lovely chimes, and the whole orchestration here is something to enjoy. It sounds like a clarinet leads us into the main section, which has some exotic percussion and a droning bass rhythm that suggests the Near East. Some of the orchestration is reminiscent of Mahler, This is a highly melodic overture whose themes are beautifully colored by the orchestration. A thoroughly enjoyable brief work at about four and a half minutes and a highlight of the album. Tracks six and seven are my two favorites on the album. Mm. Anyway, track eight, Robert Kajanus, uh, Overture Symphonica. And as I mentioned, he was the leading figure in Finnish music before Sibelius emerged as the, (laughs) pretty much the king. This is a late work from 1926, it starts with a chord, uh, sawing string tremolos, and string themes reaching upward and ending in warm, melodic figures. There's a pretty sweetly played solo violin theme after 1 minute and 30 seconds, accompanied by shimmering harp figures that grows into a full orchestral statement. The flute introduces a new section at 350, with subtle strings playing a counter melody. The music builds up to an ominous climax at the end of the fifth minute, And in the theme heard in the sixth minute, there are darker harmonies injected. The strings start rolling in the eighth minute, gorgeous clear brass and wind chords at the end. Track nine, Heino Kaski, Prelude, Opus 7. Kaski uh, spent most of his career as a teacher, kind of like us, (laughs) leaving little time for composing, kind of like us, (laughs) at least in whatever we're doing. Uh, This is an orchestration of one of his most famous piano miniatures. It's highly romantic in shape, and the orchestration relies heavily on strings for the melody and harmonic material. There's a harp playing arpeggios to anchor the harmony. It's got some smooth, satisfying harmonies, and there's even a brief crisis reached just after the one-minute mark. By 152, we're back to the romantic opening melody. And the last track, 10, a composer we've heard already on this album, Armas Jernefeldt. Preludium. This has a rather cute march rhythm to it, with appealing melodies bubbling out of the texture. At 44 seconds, it's heard more legato over a droning bass, giving it a pastoral feel. Uh, There's a long-held brass note at 113, probably a trumpet, that gives way to a new violin melody, uh, more romantic and song-like in feel. The march comes back at around 157, and this cute work comes to a close with quiet pizzicati and a final quiet brass cadence to end the album, which I'm sure is sonically spectacular in its SACD form, although it's pretty great as a streaming thing, too. So over the century, we've come to associate Finnish music with Sibelius, but because of him, with sumptuously full orchestration and gorgeous woodwind writing. And really, that all starts with these works. There doesn't seem to have been a set style for Finnish music. But at this point, it was highly romantic sounding, with lots of colorful orchestral detail, which kind of is fitting for its modernist period. All of the works on this album are highly appealing, and for me, the Palm Grin and Milk overtures stood out. The Oulu Symphonia plays them with idiomatic shaping of lines, and gets a full sound under the baton of Rumon Gamba. We get great sound on the Chandos recording, as expected. Their SACD recordings tend to be very good. And there's nothing not to like here. It's like an easy listen, and uh, it's just appealing and beautifully orchestrated, too. Nothing not to like. Gotta, gotta hear it. Yeah, I found every work on here really enjoyable. Great brass and percussion, as you often hear in mm-hmm. Finnish music, but also really nice woodwind writing, too. Some nice clarinet. The comical things you were talking about included a lot of bassoon parts that were enjoyable. Bassoons are funny. They well, they they don't have to be, or they can be used that way. Yeah, and this music is not all of one character. It covers a lot of very different moods. Right. Uh, but the common points are there are a lot of sweeping sections. 
swelling, mm. you know, sections of instruments and, and really dynamic parts. It's very romantic in style, but with a lot of variety. And so, yeah, I, re I really enjoyed it. And I hadn't heard a lot of these composers before, but now I'm glad I did. And that'd be a reference point for maybe hearing more in the future. Right. A lot of them should be uh, more well known outside of Finland than they are. You know, right. I bet Finnish people know them all. They're a very musical people, those Finns. Mm. Anyway, going back to our our home country, the USA. Well, not not our home now. We, yeah. we both live in Japan now. <laughs> not for a long time. But uh, we're we're Americans, and here we go with some American music. Jennifer Higdon, Duo Duel, and uh, her really most famous work, uh, Concerto for Orchestra. I should say most popular work, Concerto for Orchestra. This is played. Uh, the Duo Duel is by Matthew Strauss and Zvet. Stoyanov on percussion. There are two percussionists. And the Houston Symphony Orchestra conducted by Robert Spano. Now, mm. Robert Spano is a name that's strongly associated with Jennifer Higdon's music. He's been championing it for all of her career, really. Mm. In fact, the previous recording that I heard of the concert, I think there are several of them now, but the previous recording I heard was... Robert Spano conducting the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, okay. a recording mm. I still have. So it's the same uh, conductor again. This is on the Naxos label. Now, by the way, Naxos used to be a bargain label, and it's still cheaper, right, than other labels, but it's not as cheap as it used to be. And I don't think it's just because of the yen. I think they raised the price a bit from the oh. old days. I don't know. Could be. Yeah, they're a few, they're a few dollars cheaper now instead of like half price, <laughs> over half the price of everything else, which I think they once were. Anyway, uh, the two works in this album require a high level of virtuosity, so get ready for some amazing playing here, although a lot of the playing is very subtle. When I think of American composers, I, I feel like America is a very, well, the United States, I should say, is a very in-your-face yeah, place. Not subtle. <laughs> <laughs> it's not subtle. We're not, we're not subtle people. Uh, you might have noticed from this uh, podcast, in fact. <laughs> yeah. um, but... <laughs> But uh, Jennifer Higdon's got a bit of subtlety in her playing, even though she's these are two very big public works. Let's take a look. The Duo Duel is the new one for me, and this was just composed in 2020. This composition, we are told, contains 41,973 notes. Now, yeah. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. <laughs> How long is the piece? Well, it's 23 minutes long, so I guess that's a lot of notes in that short period of time. Anyway, it's dedicated to the two percussionists we hear on this recording who inspired it. They're each on one side of the stage, both in the front, and the solo instruments are all pitched percussion instruments. They play vibraphone, which they share, marimba, which is shared. Marimba is really a non-electric vibraphone, really, or vibraphone is an electric and marimba. Made of wood. The marimba has wooden bars on it, and the vibraphone has metal ones, right? Correct. Yes, and crotals, which I kind of like saying. Crotales, I guess, which are little uh, chimes on a on a rack, and a total of six timpani, three for each player. Um, you can actually see this on YouTube if you go to YouTube and type in the uh, yeah. There's a sample. Name. It, yeah, there's a sample. You can see what it looks like. The uh, two soloists frequently stand very close together to play on the same instrument. Two thirds of the concerto features the keyboard percussion instruments. She says keyboard percussion. They're not yeah. vibraphone, marimba. I don't really think of them as. They're, they're kind of like. You know, laid out like a keyboard, but I don't know if I'd call they're them that. Bars, anyway, yeah, you know, the know bars, if keys, yeah, yeah. And the final one third features the timpani, which are more like dr pitched drums. Anyway, this work starts quietly with light chiming percussion. Now, this is a little surprising for me because when you have all this percussion on stage, you expect it to make a. <laughs> it's got a triangle at the beginning. <laughs> make a noise, yeah, yeah. But it starts really with a triangle, I think, yeah. It's rather mysterious sounding at the opening and has a bit of enchantment to it. Uh, the vibraphone comes in, and so does the orchestra at the one-minute mark with strings, followed by the rest of the orchestra. The orchestra is closely recorded and rather dry sounding, uh, but the chiming percussion sounds great. I, th I think this choice was made so that the percussion mm -hmm. would make more of an impact. You, know, you don't want to get it lost in the, the room sounds. The melodic material in the orchestra is comfortable and appealing to the ear. In the third minute, you can hear the drier sound of the marimba. The brass harmony come in in minute five. In the sixth minute, there's an orchestral tutti that plays a gradually increasing tempo. It falls off, and we're in quieter material at six minutes and 30 seconds. 
We're hearing marimbas in the seventh minute with occasional single hits on the crotals. Is crotals or crotals? I guess it's crotals. Higdon often uses this sort of interlocking set of rhythmic patterns that come together in the various sections of the orchestra. There's a lot of material for the marimbas, and I guess sometimes the vibraphone is in there. Sometimes you hear them both being played at the same time. Into the 12th minute. There, the marimba gets some solo space. They play a lot of trilling material that travels into melodic patterns. At 1345, the harp comes in and plays with the marimbas for a bit. In the 16th minute, the brass play fanfare-like material, building up in waves, and this leads to some rapid figures on the marimba, which plays alone. Hayden gets a lot of sounds from the marimba that we often don't hear, and I'm especially thinking this would have been a great sample too. I know, next time. I'm thinking of the sound produced by the rapid hammering on a single bar high on the instrument. We usually don't get up that high mm. on this instrument. It's got some interesting sounds up at the top there. Some quick stop and start jerky rhythmic patterns come in in the orchestra in the 18th minute, and rumbling beneath the strings, we start to hear the timpani. They don't play very loudly, but timpani can't help but sound ominous. While they play, the orchestra continues its stop and start patterns. In the 21st minute, you can hear that occasional crotal ringing out, and the timpani and orchestra bring us to the end. So this work actually sounds like it would be fun to watch in performance. Yeah. Um, judging by the booklet notes and what I heard in the recording, there's really a clear visual aspect to it. The work itself is surprisingly mostly on the quieter and rather pretty side. Even at the end, it comes across as controlled and uh, domesticated. Not the huh. wildness that I expected from the title, a duel. You know, you expect some mm. things to get a little out of control. It's an attractive piece. I think I could have used some more room ambience on the recording, although maybe not because of the percussion come across really well. It would have given more of a sense of space and transparency to the recording, though. There is The orchestra sounds a bit kind of like a mass. So it doesn't sound as transparent as I'd, as I'd like. Um, the material sounds dense at times. All right, so we get to the concerto for orchestra, a work I'm fairly familiar with at this point. And as I mentioned, Spano uh, conducted the first recording of this work with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra on the Telarc label back in the day. The first movement was actually the last movement to be composed. It begins with chimes and timpani sounding together, then an entrance by the strings with the winds, and then the brass following. It starts out with a lively tempo and some nice chimes coming from the percussion. The music is chaotic right away in the sense that a lot is happening. Timpani are already fully busy in the movement from the beginning. The orchestra gets a lively feel, which is not surprising again since Robert Spano has been conducting this piece for years. The sound is good. Again, I'd like more room ambience. It's on the dry side. There are all kinds of intriguing sounds in the score that come across well in this performance. I liked the brass harmony and theme at 3 minutes and 30 seconds in the first movement. There are great chiming effects in the fifth minute, with the rest of the orchestra remaining busy. Brass get another theme at 7.30 or so, so I'm rather surprised by the constant use of all kinds of percussion in this movement. The movement actually ends with the orchestra and percussion seeming to run out of energy and coming to a stop. Second movement, this was, was the second movement to be written too. It was inspired by the string sound of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and it's like a scherzo in character. It starts with everyone playing pizzicato, and then slowly integrates an arco sound, first through soloists, and then with all of the players. The pizzicati are pretty rapid, and the layering of the bass and higher lines is in good contrast. This moves along like some kind of crazed dance. By the middle, sustained note patterns have taken over, with swishing lines in the strings. The movement is brief and entertaining all the way through. Movement 3, this is um, track 4, was the first movement to be written. It allows each principal player a solo before moving into the section solos. The winds are highlighted first, then after tutti we hear the strings and then the brass. It's a slow movement that starts with interesting quick glissandos in the high strings and all kinds of percussive sounds, including the piano, sounding like tuned percussion the way it's used here. The flute has the first solo fluttering like a bird. Brass harmony comes in and the English horn gets a solo melody. All sorts of harmonic iterations on the wind instruments are heard, and they all grab the ear in different ways. The bassoon and low winds are heard at around the 4 minute and 30 second mark. In the 5th and 6th minutes, we're hearing string instruments solo, first intriguingly, 
and intriguingly the double bass too. The opening uh, ghostly glissandi come back to introduce the brass section, heard it around 745. The opening rhythmic pattern with strings comes back to end the movement, which sort of loses steam and slows, after which we hear those glimmering high string glissandos again. When I say lose steam, I mean it's, that's built into the score. That's the effect that's desired here. A solo violin leads the movement to its close. Then we get to the uh, fourth movement, which connects to the fifth, by the way. It's a tribute to rhythm, according to the uh, notes, and the percussion section of the orchestra. The opening is the quietest and stillest part of the work, which is not what one might expect from percussion. The movement opens with bowed vibraphone and crotals, opening the way for the percussion to move through many of its pitched instruments, as well as collaborating with the harpist and celesta player. I love those sounds too. Eventually the musicians move to non-pitched percussion, which is emphasized by the movement's tempo speeding up at key moments. Progression of tempos carries the movement from a slow start through to the fifth movement, which continues the progression of increasing tempos. The tempo increases are meant to resemble the effect of a Victrola being wound up, by the way. Uh, some interesting sounds at the beginning. It sounds like this starts with a, I don't know what you said, but it sounds like a glass harmonica to me. Mm -hmm. um, there's something icy about the beginning of the movement, like we're in an ice cave. Uh, the metallic percussion and harp give that impression. Soon we're hearing woody percussion in the second uh, section. A sudden tempo shift introduces the timpani along with a few other heavier percussion instruments. They all make quite a racket in a way that I like. The timpani leads <laughs> us directly into the next movement, movement five, which begins with the entrance of the violins. It highlights the entire orchestra and has its rhythm set up through an ostinato in the percussion, which has been carried over from the previous movement. The strings come in over the timpani, which continue to play. Here, there are many quick changing sections, almost like individual panels featuring different paintings. Tempo suddenly increases in the second minute. This part is driven by percussion and brass. There's a sudden quieting in the third minute. The piece starts getting wild towards the end with all sorts of rolling, stop and start rhythmic patterns. The ending is exciting and explosive. So listening to this work is kind of like watching a fireworks display. So there we go, back to the Royal Fireworks. <laughs> I made a big circle. You feel like you want to keep saying ooh or ah. Uh, there are a lot of lovely orchestrated moments in the score. In this case, I think I like the earlier um, Telarc album better for its sound quality, but this is an equally excellent performance, and you have the pairing of the duo duel. If you're interested in that pairing, you want to go for uh, this album, and I think the duo duel is well worth hearing. Uh, both works are interesting and worth getting to know, especially the concerto for orchestra. It's a pretty well-known work by now. Yeah, the, the ending there, I wrote <laughs> it's a big West Side Story ending when it, it may be. gets to the end, yeah. It is American. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, her music is kind of enigmatic to me. It as is far kind of as, enigmatic. Uh, it's a good word. Yeah. Following what's going to come next in the structures, uh, it uh, takes you on a little journey, but it's all really energetic, mm -hmm. and oftentimes it's quite pretty, too. I mean, even in the duel, there were pretty yeah. little sections in it. Yeah, even prettier for being unexpected, I would say. Yeah. You know? And there's lots of timbral variety. You're going to hear all the instruments yeah. used in interesting ways and blended well. And the recording, like you said, it's a little dry, but it is very clear. So I could mm -hmm. hear, you know, each individual part quite well and mm -hmm. be able to follow all those different strains of things going on. Yeah. Interesting music. Really exciting. Not difficult to listen to at all. Yeah. It's, e it's easy to listen to, but there is a lot to listen to, there too. Is, yeah. So you could make yourself busy if you wanted to. A lot of things on going on at once. Yeah. yeah you could uh, choose... Uh, to just lay back and enjoy it or just kind of really focus and just right. kind of just make your ear do some work. <laughs> you know? Right. Depends what, how you approach it. All right. And over on the jazz side, I've got three recordings that I think are really excellent this week. Yeah. I mean, I always think that. <laughs> but I always think some that more. too. We, we always like the jazz records. Sometimes we get the classic words. They're never a dud, but they're kind of not as kind of up to speed mm. as I'd like, really. But um, and that never happens with the jazz recordings. I don't know. I only want to talk about things that I really like. So Well, I, me too, kind of, but I get yeah. some artists sometimes, you know, classical musicians, sometimes they go off the deep end. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Well, what would happen sometimes with the jazz, I'll just screen something, you know, based on one or two tracks that I check out before I pick it. And then when I listen to the whole thing, the rest of it lets me down. But uh, this week, 
No, nothing like that. And here's the surprise. You sort of stole my thunder a little bit earlier. I wasn't oh, going to say do? what I was going to do. But uh, yeah, I'm going to try something new this episode. That's going to be some sound clips. All right. If this works, I'll do it too eventually. <laughs> we haven't done <laughs> this before. Happens. One was mainly for uh, editing reasons. There's a lot of things to edit on a podcast right. anyway. But two is copyright reasons. Yeah. So let me start this with a fair use disclaimer. The clips are for commentary and educational purposes, and we recommend that listeners listen to the complete recordings, as always, all of which are available on streaming services in the links provided, and we suggest that if you enjoy the music, you consider purchasing the CDs or high-quality downloads to support the artists. In other words, be like me. <laughs> buy the, like buy the recordings. <laughs> So we've got uh, drum-led groups and lots of vibes as a theme tonight. So I think you're going to like this. We've heard some vibes in the classical already, and I'm going to hear some more. And we're going to start out with a drum-led recording. That's drummer Brandon Sanders. His new recording, Compton's Finest, it's on Savant Records, came out August 25th, so it's fresh. And Sanders, if you don't know him, he was born in 1971 in Kansas City. Kansas he moved with his mother to L.A. at the age of two, and he settled in Compton for our non-U.S. listeners. That's a city in southern Los Angeles County. He grew up in a musical family. His mother played the violin, and he had a stepfather who played trombone. And in his studies, though, he studied communications, getting both an undergraduate and master's degree at the University of Kansas. When he did go back to study music at Boston's Berklee College of Music. And around 2004, he went to New York, where he jumped in the jazz scene there and worked with a lot of big names, Joe Lovano, Mike Ladon, Peter Bernstein, Jeremy Pelt, Esperanza Spaulding. But this is his debut as a leader here. And along with his fine drumming, we've got Keith Brown on piano, Chris Lewis, tenor sax, Eric Wheeler, bass, Warren Wolf on the vibes, and... Jasmine Horn contributes some vocals on two yeah. tracks. And the recording's produced by drummer Willie Jones III. We're going to start out with the standard, Softly as in a Morning Sunrise. Oscar Hammerstein, Sigmund Romberg tune from The New Moon, 1928 operetta. And Sanders starts it out here with an eight-measure drum intro with kind of a Latin-y groove. Lewis takes the melody with his thick-sounding tenor sax tone, but listen to the rising vibes lines from Wolf behind him. It's kind of cool. Uh, who then takes over on the B section of the melody, uh, where they change it up to swing, and Wheeler switches up from snappy bass figures to walking. Lewis continues on with the sax solo. I like the mix of staccato figures into more flowing lines that he plays. They keep it swinging under Wolf's vibes solo, and has great chugging groove to it. Brown gets a swinging piano solo with some cool speedy descending lines. And once more around the melody with the rhythm switch-ups and a few fun repeats of the final two measures to end it. Then we're going to get the first of two Sanders' original compositions. That's the title track, Compton's Finest. And it's a repeating riff-based minor 12-bar blues. Sax and vibes take the melody together. A tasty piano tremolo on the turnaround there, and it gets more push from walking bass on the repeat. Wolf's up first, making the vibes blue with nice melodic mallet work, and Lewis follows, working on low riffs into some double time lines, and Brown starts his piano solo with a smooth touch, getting into some interesting rhythmic interval ideas, and Wheeler gets a bass solo with some speedy and high working lines. Uh, nice thick toned bass he's got there. A couple more times through the tune with final phrase repeats, and that wraps it up. And the surprise here, I Can't Help It, which is actually a Stevie Wonder tune. It was a hit for Michael Jackson, right? It goes back to his 1979 Off the Wall hmm. recording. So Brown gets it going with the piano riff, and we get treated to Jasmine Horn's vocals. Wolf adds ringing vibes, and Horn has a little touch of vocal fry. <laughs> yeah, she's got like here. a hoarseness like uh, yeah. in the lower range, which I hadn't heard before, so I know her from her... Uh first album a social right. call which i thought was just fantastic yeah. you know but i haven't been keeping up with her too much i was a little i, I like her i like when she's smooth anyway let's just say this that melody kind of keeps her voice she's good here though i mean yeah in the low mm. range of uh, where she works and it's kind of smoky so actually let's uh have our first little sample here Running 
Yeah, it's pretty nice. It's a little smoky there, a little edge, and I really like that groove. Yeah, it sounded good too. Yeah. All right, well, Sanders has that clicky groove going, and uh, as it goes on, he gets into a little bit more of an R&B kick that he adds to it. Lewis has a smooth but throaty tenor sax solo, ending in a nice trill on the tune, and Wolf has a rhythmic and happy vibes solo. And Horn comes back for another round, and then Lewis joins in with some more sax. Uh, they vamp around, and Horn gets up high at the end with some vocal lines uh, before it fades out, as we've heard her do on her, uh, her own releases. Track four is Voyage, and this is a uh, Kenny Barron tune from his 1986 album, What If? It's a hard swinging, hard bop minor tune. It's an AABA 32 measure tune. It's got a lot of cool modulating riffs in the melody that's taken together again here, uh, unison, sax, and vibes. Brown solos first on piano with smooth flowing boppy lines and a punchy left hand. Uh, he even sounds smooth on choppy ideas. Wolf's next on vibes, and he gets some modulating riffs and nice swinging melodic ideas. And Lewis has a swinging and snappy phrased tenor solo. And check out the quote from Fascinating Rhythm that he throws in there. <laughs> uh, Sanders gets a drum solo, showing off some restrained finesse, and they close it out with another round of the melody. Another jazz standard body and soul for track five, Johnny Green, Edward Heyman, Robert Sauer. This is the musical theme for uh, underscoring the kind of film noir body and soul uh, hmm. about boxing, I guess, in 1930. Great ballad to have vibes on, and Wolf has a ringing cloud of vibes chords uh, behind Lewis's sax melody. Piano comes in for backing when Wolf takes over the melody on the bridge, and Sanders is super soft on the drum brushes. Lewis continues on with a tasty restrained solo, and Brown has short ringing piano solo with nice dynamics before Wolf wraps up the solos on the bridge with the vibes. And Lewis is back for the last A section of the melody to a soft ending. Track six, Monk's Dream, Thelonious Monk that is, uh, from his Thelonious Monk Trio album, 1954. This is uh, one of Monk's happier sounding tunes with a signature quirky kind of harmonies at the end of the phrases. Uh, they take it at a nice relaxed tempo, vibes and sax sharing the melody again. I like Wheeler's one note bass bounce on the bridge section, and Sanders kicks it up to a nice swing push for Lewis's sax solo. It has some interesting melodic ideas and a sense of playfulness. Wolf has some fun speedy figures in his solo, and he gets even more playful. And Brown starts out with some cool two-handed figures uh, on his piano solo, and he gets some interesting ideas with a little uh, turkey in the straw quote uh, before getting back <laughs> to uh, Monk's melody. And Wheeler has a melodic and bluesy bass solo before they hit the melody for a final run. Track seven, In a Sentimental Mood, Duke Ellington, 1935, recorded with his orchestra, of course. Uh, Lewis sits this one out, but Jasmine Horn is back, and she starts out the rising lyric line solo. Uh, they give it a twist with a bossa groove. Horn sounds good here, down in her lower register again, and with higher and breathy lines. Uh, Wolf had some vibes fills between the lyrics on the way, and uh, Brown has a really great piano solo uh, here. Let's check this out a little bit. Okay. Uh, we'll join in right about uh, the two minute mark. really nice isn't it yeah flows and chimes away and then uh well the horn's back with another smoky verse to finish it up into a final long held note really tasty version and the recording is going to end up with sjb this is uh, sander's other original composition and uh 
he gives two short tom hits to bring in this fun and funky tune it's got a great 60s hard bop funky and bluesy 24 measure melody and uh yeah check out center has got this kind of billy higgins like tappy groove and the funky bass and left hand piano line and saxon vibes get the bluesy melody so this is the last one let's uh take a sample of this too you know when you have a melody that cool you want to hear it again and of course they repeat it <laughs> once yeah, more. again and again yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh yeah it's really a cool original tune old blue note kind of funkiness to it when it comes out of that second repeat they uh, have a nice solo break for lewis's sax and he gets some grease on the tasty bluesy licks on this one uh, wolf gets a vibe solo on this one too and brown has a rollicking fun piano solo but oh he's just getting going <laughs> And it's time to wrap it up with a final run through the melody with uh -huh. a little tag ending to end the recording. And that's it. So it's a nice debut as a leader, firmly rooted in the jazz tradition. We got Ellington, we got Monk, a couple standards, and two bluesy originals. The program spiced up with the more R&B Stevie Wonder Michael Jackson tune and Jasmine Horn's vocals on two tracks. Uh, that's a nice balance for a debut recording. Sanders isn't a showy drummer at all. He swings hard and he sticks in the pocket with great grooves and very clean sounding tones around the drum kit. Vibes and sax carrying the melodies together is an appealing combination and everyone has skillful and tasty solos. The only criticism I have here is it's quite short at only 39 minutes, the longest track being Monk's Dream at just over six minutes. At least one or two tracks could have let the solos go on for a bit more, especially mm -hmm. Brown's solo who was just getting warmed up uh, on the SJB final track. Anyway, that'll just make us look forward more to hearing what he does next, a tasty one for this recording. Yeah, like I, I also said, it's an appealing album that was over way too soon. <laughs> yeah, and like you, I said, I, uh, these guys could have stretched out more on the tracks, but they seem to have like an allotted amount of solo time. You can kind of, you can kind of yeah. tell that, which is cool though. The soloing was all really good. Uh, the vibraphone sound on this record was so rich and beautiful, and we heard a little bit of it yeah. um, in those samples. Um, the piano sound is realistic, and we heard one of those great piano solos too. And the sax is up close and rich toned as well. Everyone sounds great. They were all playing to serve the music and, you know, not themselves, mm. which for me is always a, a big plus. It's kind of a laid back, appealing album, very straightforward in style and really very enjoyable. Yeah. It's hard not to like this one. Yeah. You can't not like this. It's kind of, you know, right. put this on after the uh, overtures from Finland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you really want to stylistically do that to your brain, we do it every week. So we this is what we're all about. We want you right. kind of changing genres let's see all right we're going to keep the good vibes coming as they say Th that might be our title you know good vibes can we do that we have we done that before i don't think so ah there it is yeah let's use it good vibes something yeah we've good had vibes. Uh, summer vibes i don't know we've had a okay. few vibes titles but um yeah maybe we can use that one we're going to keep the vibes going here with vibes on a breath that's the title of ted Piltzecker's new recording, and this is uh, OA2, that's Origin Arts Records. And who's Ted Piltzecker? Well, he's got a bachelor's of music from the Eastman School of Music and a master's of music at the Manhattan School of Music. And he's on the faculty of the Hart School. He's performed with lots of uh, great jazz names in the New York area. Vic Juris, Rufus Reed, Todd Kuhlman, drummers Louis Nash, uh, the list goes on and on. Pianists, uh, John Hicks, a favorite of mine, Bill Charlap, uh, lots of big names. And he's got uh, some previous recordings as a leader going back to 1985, Destinations, 
1997 Unicycle Man, and that's because <laughs> uh, the notes say he's an avid unicyclist and a pilot, so he's a man of many interests. Standing Alone 2001 and Brindica 2018. On this recording, we've got a really interesting collection of instrumentation here that makes really great arrangements. So in addition to Piltzecker's vibraphones, we've got Brad Good on trumpet, Paul McKee on trombone, John Gunther, tenor sax and bass clarinet, Will Swindler, baritone sax, Paul Romain on drums, and Gonzalo Teppa, bass, Judith Leclerc, bassoon on one track, and we got Javier Diaz on percussion on two tracks. And we're going to start it out with a tune that I don't know why we don't hear more. We always hear Somewhere Over the Rainbow, but uh, this is such a cute tune, If I Only Had a Brain. Yeah, this is a really great song, actually, yeah. Yeah, and we should hear it more often. It's very appealing. Teppa starts it out here with a solo four measure loping bass line, and Piltzucker takes the melody on vibes. It's nice and relaxed, and then you'll get the first taste of what makes this recording stand out, the horn arrangements, uh, coming in here with great harmonized backing lines. Trombone and Barry add a nice thickness to the arrangement. I like the new harmonies and stretches on the end of the song sections they give it. Piltzucker lets the vibes ring out at the end of the melody, and it's time for a trumpet solo from Mr. Good. And he squeezes <laughs> into it with some nice half valve sounds, a great old timey sound, and style with really clear high notes. I like this so much, being a trumpet player, that I want to sample this okay. one. So we're, we're going to jump in if I can uh, hit it at the right spot. Wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, hmm. Squeezing them right out of there. Wow. Bluesy staccato notes, no rush in the phrasing. Well, after that, McGee gets a warm flowing trombone solo next. And they do a stop time thing with soft horn hits to back Piltzecker's solo. He rings out melodic improvised phrases. The horns get some final nicely arranged lines with repeats of the final phrase over Remain's drum textures. And then once more in sync with the vibes. A really cool tune to start things out. Track two, Nature Boy, another standard. Uh, this is uh, written by Eden Abez, who is a very really interesting character, uh, influential in like the early hippie movement going back to the 40s. And he composed this song, and so there's a story behind it. I remember reading it once. Anyway, he got it through someone too, Nat King Cole, who made a hit, a number one hit for eight weeks in 1948. It's kind of a haunting minor melody. Anyway, the horns and vibes started out uh, with an introduction of original lines of intervals that exchange with the drums and then bass into a long held chord with nicely sliding trombone. Then Piltzucker brings in the minor melody, all solo and rubato. It's haunting over little drum tom textures, then bowed bass and horn lines with some bass clarinet in there too. Single bass notes ring out before they suddenly break into a lightly swinging tempo with the vibes melody. There are cool rhythmic change-ups and great horn lines. A drum break and a final horn line tag lead into a longing trombone solo from McKee with floating horn lines behind him. And Teppa gets great ringing little bass solo spots behind a fun horn arrangement with bass clarinet. They get back to the swinging vibes melody with rhythmic change-ups, and Piltzucker takes a final subdued line into a dark horn chord to finish it up. Now we're going to get one of Piltzucker's originals, Roaring Fork Closure. It's a fun tune. The horns open it, answered by the drums. Then there's an eight-measure setup with bouncing ostinato bass and ominous horn hits, like in a spy theme. The melody's 29 measures, well, with swinging figures taken by vibes and trumpet with the other horns backing. And they go around that twice. Gunther gets a tenor solo, swinging with a good edge to the tone. A little horn section interlude brings in another exciting trumpet solo from Good. It's sassy with some more half-valve tastes and some cool staccato triplets in this one. Piltzucker is next on vibes with some speedy licks and cool close harmonies with multiple mallets. 
uh, once more around the melody with a cool final stacking of horn lines to finish it. Another Piltzker original for four. We'll get through this. Uh, it starts out with a bluesy loping bass vibes and drums groove. Harmony muted trumpet gets a melody line. Seems to be an AAB 24 measure construction. The A like section has alternating bluesy chords for four measures and then changes up with some minor movement before a turnaround. And trombone gets the lead on the repeat of that section with horn backing. The next B section has a more dreamy kind of major chord sound to it that Pilziker takes the lead over. Tepa's bass gets an A section, then trumpet and trombone split one, and then another dreamy vibes B section. Nice horn lines under all of these different sections. There's a double time feel change up for all the horns together into some more vibes, and Good's open muted trumpet then leads the ending to a longer chord with some playful ornaments. Then track five, the Oliver Nelson classic tune, Stolen Moments. Uh, this was first uh, released by Eddie Lockjaw Davis's big band in uh, 1960 or 61. But of course, the classic Oliver Nelson recording, Blues in the Abstract Truth, with Eric Dolphy, Freddie Hubbard, Bill Evans, Paul Chambers, Roy Haynes. Uh, it's a great recording. Uh, this was always a cool tune, but they give it a unique arrangement. Javier Davis joins in on Latin percussion, and Tepa lays down a bass groove. There's about a one-minute intro with Barry sax and vibe lines, some solo tenor sax, and uh, horn hits into syncopated lines with vibes. If you know the original, the familiar horn lines kick in then with some ringing vibes to set up the melody, which is carried by vibes and a muted trumpet. Let's have a listen to the start of this because uh, it's a really cool arrangement of this tune. Makes a nice mood uh, before we get into the main tune. Uh, once it gets going, the trombone takes the original Freddie Hubbard trumpet line. So that was kind of a neat little twist. And then all the horns are in together on the arrangement with trade-offs with that trombone line. It gets off on a steady swing over walking bass for a, a vibe solo from Piltzecker. There's a horn arrangement transition to a smoother trombone solo from McKee and another horn transition to a trumpet solo from Good. And he plays things really smooth here with lots of cool licks. Uh, the horns get a tight arrangement with vibes and syncopated hits and it gets more rhythmic with some breaks over percussion connecting back to the melody taken by all the horns and vibes together with the trombone answering lines and some final fun phrase repeats over that Latin percussion to a fade out. Track 6 subconscious Lee, as in the name L-E-E, -E, that's Lee Konitz, great alto saxophonist. This is a jazz album by Konitz with Lenny Tristano that was recorded in 1949 and 50 and released on the Prestige label in 1955. Here the drums give a brushed four bar intro and then Gunther's bass clarinet and Tepa's bass get to take a new intro melody in unison with the other horns, giving backing and surprising hits. When Konitz's main melody starts, Piltzecker joins with Gunther then and Teppa gets into a walking underneath on the bass. Piltzecker solos first. It's an interesting one with lots of snappy ideas and cool spaces with corduroy ideas between the speedy lines. There's a horn arrangement section with trumpet working with vibes and other backing horn lines. Bass gets a short solo and then Romain's skittering drums get little solo sections between the horn lines. Really fun arranging here before Gunther and Piltzecker take it on another run through the melody with more fun horn backing to finish it up. Track 7, Hoagy Carmichael's New Orleans. The first recording of this and first release by Benny Moten's Kansas City Orchestra with a vocal refrain by the great Jimmy Rushing, 1932, goes back a ways. A really nice 
arranged horn opening on this one. Piltzucker gets a rhythmic chords vibes backing going over the New Orleans light snare drum of Romain, and Gunther gets the melody on bass clarinet, which sounds really great. Let's check out a little bit of the beginning of this tune. to a bass clarinet right there's a lot of really attractive sounds in that too it's just the vibes as well just sound oh, yeah. fantastic you know mckee then gets the b section of that melody on trombone and uh, then gunther comes back to finish it up on the bass clarinet and carry on into a solo great lazy phrasing and feel yeah <laughs> like imagine that you know the bass clarinet is just gonna go to sleep a uh, piltzucker has a little tremolo backing figures with the horns and then gets a vibe solo with great malady melodic ideas. The horns trade off sections with the drums, and Teppa gets to work some bowed bass too, before Gunther's back with the bass clarinet melody, and he takes it way down low on that repeat when you hear it at the end. I, I love that sound. The horns take it to a rippling wash of vibes and their own final minor chord. Track eight, we've got another standard. John Burke, Jimmy Van Hughes, and It Could Happen to You. The song was uh, written in 1943. And uh, it was in the musical comedy film And the Angels Sing the following year. A fun intro of snappy bass figures from Teppa and Horn Answers. The ushers in Piltzucker on the melody. He plays it gently and with a great swing feel. Fun horn hits and lines fill in and around. A very cool arrangement. A fun break and a horn fall then gets Piltzucker going on a solo. As he swings away, they all shift it up with a more driving, walking bass underneath. There's a transition with the snappy bass intro idea and some horn trills into lines that lead to solo spots from McGee's trombone. And Piltzucker gets another run through the melody. And there's a fun arrangement with bass lines and horn hits to a happy final chord. Track 9, In Your Quiet Place by Keith Jarrett. And this is uh, Gary Burton and Keith Jarrett. Uh, 1971 album and it was actually like a compilation it's got like a vibes intro to it called Moonchild so it was Moonchild slash in your quiet place a big drum kick in and horn lines to a rubato vibes minor melody start gets a happy gospel bounce into a clicky settled gospel beat uh, good gets some soft lyrical melodic trumpet lines there are happy major twists in the tune along the way Piltzucker's vibe solo has a lot going on, navigating through the harmonic twists and turns, but he always builds great lines. Swindler gets a gutsy berry sax solo on this one, and the horns stack into little arranged sections with a bluesy bass line from Teppa before another go around through the melody sections. Trumpet and trombone get some joyful trades, with good squeezing it out way up high again, and they vamp into a bluesy ending with some final vibe touches from Piltzucker. Track 10, Seven Steps to Heaven. Miles Davis tune, of course, uh, with Victor Feldman from the same titled album, 1963. And whereas the original started out with Ron Carter's pulsing bass, here Piltzucker gets it going with an intro of solo rubato vibes. But don't worry, Teppa's got that snappy bass ready, and it's mixed with little horn figures that take it to the horn-arranged stabby melody with tight drum fills from Remain. Uh, check out the little interlude section horn arrangement uh, with unison bass and barry sax line as well. Let's listen to uh, just to how it gets started because it's such a famous tune. Thank you. 
another sample of all the fun arranging that's going on on this album. Yeah, it's, this is really great for that, in fact. Yeah. It's, uh, all the way through. All right. So the, after they go through the melody, it sets up Swindler for a super swinging Barry sax solo over fast walking bass. The horns get some trades with solo drums from Remain into a longer drum solo, and they have a new transition section into another run through the melody. And the recording ends up with another Piltzaker original, Track 11 Bus. This one's quite different. <laughs> there's a sound of something like a harpsichord chords that comes in, and I don't, there's nothing in the credits about that, so I don't know what this is, if it's a, a keyboard effect or it's some effect that uh, Piltzaker has going on. Uh, but then you can also hear vibes chime in together with that sound. And then the big surprise with uh, Judith LeClaire's uh, entrance on Bassoon, with a, first a lyrical line before getting a kind of descending low repeated lick going that's over on the hi-hat there's a different line of syncopated notes into a descending line that's on that uh, vibes and harpsichord sound that weaves behind and repeats horn lines are layered on and then there's so much going on in this arrangement uh, the horns take the focus for a while with a happy syncopated arrangement and that alternates with the sections we heard previously about midway through a new groove gets going with bass drums and latin percussion a snaky bassoon riff winds on top for a bit and a horn arrangement builds up into a gurgly and squealy fun trumpet solo from good and we hear the harpsichord sounding line return with some more bassoon lines to a fade out ending you know i was thinking on on this track um there's mm. there are a lot of classical sounds on this like the bassoon as you mentioned this, this should really be our theme song you know because it kind of mixes classical and jazz <laughs> yeah, together in a lot of ways kind of like yeah. we do so it stands out in a good way uh, mm. from the other type of arrangements on the recording Right. Anyway, a really good collection of tunes, standards, originals by jazz greats, and Piltzucker's own interesting originals. What makes this recording so great is the arrangements, though. Uh, they're fresh and keep introducing interesting twists in the tunes all the way to the end. Uh, the different horns give lots of timbral variety, and when they're all together, they sound like a little big band. Having barry sax, bass clarinet, and even bassoon on one recording gives a lot of low-end woodwind happiness. Piltzaker's vibes playing is enthusiastic and swinging, great melodies and technique, and all the other solos are energetic and skillful, with Good's trumpet standing out with a unique style of his own. I really enjoyed this recording. I think you will, too. Yeah, me too. It was a great sounding recording, too, yeah. something that I wanted to mention, because I, I was noticing that, especially on the um, New Orleans track, we could hear like every instrument like yeah. way to the back, really great. But the whole record's like that. Um, I was all in, uh, right from the first track, if I only yeah. had a brain. Like you said, it's a great song that doesn't get enough attention, and the arrangement is surprisingly mellow. Mm. The horn arrangements are really smooth, like because we think about it from the Wizard of Oz, right? With it's right. kind of a jumpy tune, but here it's kind of like I I almost felt like it was like uh, you know Ken after an evening with Barbie, like with his <laughs> finally kinda, had a braid. He's, <laughs> yeah, finally had a braid. He's all sleepy from me, right? Or or languid, languor. Yeah. Languorous or something, you know? So I got that vibe from that. I also like the inclusion of discords at key spots for emphasis. That's always a thing yeah. that appeals to me. I just love dissonances. I don't know. Uh, except in life. <laughs> Only in music. <laughs> with people, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with people. I don't know. So much to say about the one track alone, really. Um, but it sets the tone for the rest of the album, which has classy vibraphone playing, great horn arrangements, as you said, and really great playing all around. Lots of interesting arrangements, too. Like, each track is, like, really different. Hmm. A lot of styles on the album. All beautifully played. Yeah, this is um, a fair... It's a pretty sophisticated album, yes, I'd say. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So if you're... That kind of guy, you like your um, whiskey, you drink your whiskey when you're listening to jazz. This is a great record to do that <laughs> That's the too. kind of guy I am, yeah. I'm going to be yeah. listening to this one a lot in the future, I think. Yeah. All right, and not going to let you down with the third recording either. This is uh, a really great recording. I'm just starting to get into, uh, I need some I, more I really listens. this, yeah. Yeah, to pull right everything right. out. And it's got an interesting story to go with it. It's drummer Richard Baratas, off the charts, on Savant Records, came out August 25th. Now, Barata in the 1970s was a young drummer in the New York City loft scene. He was playing with uh, people like John Stubblefield, Vernon Reed, Hal Galper. But 1984, he made a big switch into the film industry. Uh, you know, he was you know, making as much money as he could. I guess he started a family 
you know, music's a tough business. You would think the film business <laughs> would be even harder yeah, know, to make right? it in. But he lucked out there. He started out as a location scout for Desperately Seeking Susan, and now he's worked on over 50 movies, uh, first as a location manager, then Boy. a unit production manager, and for the past 15 years, co-producer and executive producer. What movies, you might ask, uh, how about uh, Joker, hmm. The Irishman, Doctor Strange, Wolf of Wall Street, five Spider-Man movies, Too Big to Fail, The Smurfs. Uh, Donnie Brasco, boy, this, the list goes on Jeez, and on. Geez, did he do any movies that <laughs> failed? I mean, I think most of them do. <laughs> but anyway, from 2016, he returned to music, and then he's played with some big names uh, since getting back into the scene. Eric Alexander, Vincent Herring, Craig Handy, Bruce Harris, uh, Bill O'Connell, Emmett Cohen, the list goes on, and Dave Kakoski, who is on this album. And when I saw that... Mm. I said, that oh, usually is a big out. attraction to both of us, really. Yeah. So he's recorded four albums since he's come back into music. And the previous recordings were Music in Film, The Real Deal, R-E-E-L, and Music in <laughs> Film, The Sequel. And these take up famous songs from movies. And we almost... I almost picked this one for an episode because we were going to do a movie music episode. Right, we never did. Yeah. yeah. And this was on my list. and uh, But then when I saw this one, I said, oh, I'm going to have to get to this one. For this new one, Off the Charts, what does that mean? Uh, he says he wanted to focus on music that he loved while he was growing up and also specifically about pieces that weren't the most popular numbers on the records that he liked. Quote, the tunes that weren't as well publicized or listened to or re-recorded by other musicians, but were really outstanding in their own way. So... 60s and 70s tunes by other jazz musicians. And so that's the focus here. And so Barata's on the drums. We've got uh, the great Jerry Borgonzi on tenor sax, Dave Kikoski on piano, John Patitucci on bass, and Paul Rossman adding some extra percussion, especially on the latin -y tunes. And we're going to start out with uh, Bobby Hutcherson, great vibes player. Herzog, this is from 1968 Total Eclipse with Chick Corea. Barata says of this tune, quote, I remember hearing and instantly loving this tune and later wondering why nobody really played it or recorded it. But we just heard this uh, a few weeks <laughs> back, episode 126 on vibraphonist Jalen Baker's Be Still. So mm. if you hear this episode, Richard, check that out too. Maybe you'll uh, like it and maybe there's a trend in uh, getting this song re-recorded. Anyway, it's off to a speeding swing on this great modal tune. Bergonzi's muscular tenor on the melody and Barata is really driving it with great cymbal work. And Kakoski's up first for a solo, uh, just bursting with energy. And this is where I got hooked <laughs> right away <laughs> when I started hearing this. So maybe we can uh, check out a little bit of his solo here. It's, as usual, really exciting. And what I really like is Barata gives him a lot of uh, room on this album to really work things up. with energy all those uh, and just keeps great, going great just, it goes on and on yeah. idea yeah. and idea yeah. after idea wow you know amazing so great fills and accents on the drums from Barata behind Bergonzi follows with a nice edge on his phrases and some high cries on the sax and Patitucci switches effortlessly from fast walking to snappy figures locking in with Barata and Kakoski and Bergonzi trade off some soling with Barata who gets some very cool tom ideas into his solo sections once more through the tune to a little stretched out ending for Bergonzi to blow a final rising line Track two is called Molten Glass. This is uh, by Joe Farrell, who is the uh, reed player, sax and other instruments, from uh, Chick Corea's original Return to Forever. And this is from 1970 Joe Farrell Quartet album. Bergonzi sits this one out, leaving Kikoski to shine on the melody of this uh, pretty tune with a bossa nova feel. Rossman adds light extra shaker and percussion into Barada's clicky beat. Kokoski continues on into a solo, nice dynamics, flowing touch in his lines, finishing up in some great ripples. 
And Patatucci gets a bass solo next. He's got such a great tone. Uh, clear attack, ringing notes. And then Kukowski leads them through the pretty tune again to the end. A nice show of softer Latin textures from Barata uh, through this one. Track three is Blackberry Winter. It's a tune written by Alec Wilder and Lunas McGlonahan, but it was recorded on 1977 Silence by Keith Jarrett. It's a very pretty melody here that Bergonzi takes with a tender edge to it. Patitucci's solid ringing bass gives the rhythmic pulse as Barata is just painting really faint textures with super light brushes. You have to listen really carefully to hear them. Kiskowski has a lovely long restrained solo on this one with chiming notes, and Bergonzi keeps it light on his solo too, a short one back into the melody to finish it up. Now we've heard the really super soft side of Barata on this tune. Track four, a McCoy Tyner tune, Parasina, from his 1968 album Expansions. It's a very cool Latin groove with Barata's drums and Rossman's percussion, along with Patatucci's groove. Bergonzi sits this one out, but you know on a McCoy Tyner modal kind of tune, it's going to be a showcase for Kikoski. Uh, let's check out the beginning of this tune as it gets started. <laughs> adds a lot to that. Well, the main melody section of the tune starts after a minute and a half. And the original recording had Woody Shaw, Gary Bartz, and Wayne Shorter. So he had horns carrying it. But here, Kukowski has enough magic going on to make it full and interesting. He continues on into another great solo and then a run through the melody sections to a vamping fade out. Track five is a Joe Henderson tune, Afrocentric, from 1969's Power to the People. And oh yeah, a funky groove here, a great locking in of Patatucci's electric bass, and with Kikoski's left hand Rhodes piano over Barata and Rossman's drums and percussion to set up Bergonzi to bring in the melody. Uh, this is really different kind of character. Let's take a listen to the beginning of this just to see how different the mood is with the Rhodes and the electric bass. <laughs> and the left hand really locking in there. Uh, by the way, I think this is one of the few recordings where Ron Carter played electric bass on oh, the wow. original. Yeah, so if you can, haven't heard that, check that out. Uh, anyway, on this tune, Bergonzi has an intense solo, getting some angsty phrases out. Kakoski has a dizzying solo of rhythmic roads and runs, and Patatucci keeps the bass ideas really popping on the electric bass. Barata mixes things up with cool fills. Bergonzi brings the melody back early, and we get what I was hoping for, uh, which is a vamp and some drum time from Barata that goes on from uh, about four and a half minutes on the tune. And he jams out to a sudden ending. Uh, very cool. Track six is a Wayne Shorter tune, Lost. It's from 1965's The Soothsayer album. Bergonzi's out on this one as well, but Kukowski brings it in with a solo piano, ringing descending chords, lots of ringing repeated bass notes from Patatucci, and listen to Barata's cymbal work tracing out the 6-8 rhythms. He gets a lot of variety of tones and textures on the kit, and especially the cymbals. Kukowski works up a solo into a great chiming climax on this one, and Patatucci has a nice melodic solo as well. And listen for the subtle control of the pitch in Patatucci's longer notes. Uh, he must have really strong fingers to be able to adjust the tone like that as he goes through. Kukowski rings it through the melody once more to wrap it up to some final trickles. And track seven 
is a Charles Lloyd's tune, uh, Sombrero Sam. This is from the great uh, 1966 recording, Dream Weaver. Ooh, some bluesy solo bass from Patitucci into mm. a very cool ostinato and drums and percussion and funky piano to get it started. And uh, we really need to uh, hear this intro to uh, give Patitucci a little bit of bass time. So let's check this out. stuff going on there I, I i hate to stop these samples because it sounds yeah. so good yeah, yeah, yeah uh, anyway yeah. the drums and percussion uh gets some nice highlight uh section as well and kokoski really hammers out a great bluesy solo on this one uh keith jarrett was the pianist on the original uh, i have this recording i, I like it a lot Bergonzi sax joins in late on the riffy melody just as lloyd's flute did on the original uh tune and after some drums and percussion he gets to blow some uh, honky lines and angsty cries on this one and Barata gets a tasty solo here too and it fades out much to Mike's displeasure <laughs> yeah especially in this one because there was like this really cool drum solo going on and they faded on the drum solo yeah. you know there was an earlier track that faded on a Kikoski, um you know, track four yeah Perizina faded on a Kikoski solo too I was like oh this guy's gonna have so many ideas Why, <laughs> you know now I'm not gonna hear them all yeah Ugh. anyway all right track eight is uh, Chick Corea tune Tones for Jones Bones from hmm. the album of the same title, 1968. Bergonzi sits out on this one as well. Kakowski gets it off to a rubato start over deep bass notes from Patatucci. Barata's soon stirring up a quick rhythm with tight brushes and locking in with the snappy bass. Kakowski sounds great on Korea's melody with great accents. Patatucci gets a bass solo with great melodic sense and direction. Kakowski follows and Barata switches up the sticks to drive things more on the cymbals. Kakoski has another really inspired solo here, and he gets to really open up with smooth running melodic lines and exploding chords. They bring it suddenly back uh, soft for another run through the melody, and final tasty trickles on the piano. Great energy on this tune. And the recording wraps up with Out of This World, uh, Harold Arlen and Johnny Mercer tune from 1945. It's from the movie of the same title. Uh, but here they're honoring the rendition that John Coltrane did on his uh, Coltrane 1962 album on Impulse Records. And they give it a similar kind of 6-8 groove with the Latin and then modal chord backing. It's like the original lot. And of course, Bergonzi is going to be on this one because you know he's a real Coltrane disciple and he sounds really inspired on the melody, uh, as does Kikoski bringing out the chords. And McCoy Tyner was the pianist on the original. Uh, so you can tell these guys are really enjoying playing this. Also, it was uh, Elvin Jones on drums and Verata shows a real nice matching finesse around the drum kit on this tune. Kikoski has an impactful solo and Bergonzi is particularly intense on this one. After just uh, room for a few breaths after his solo, he has another powerful blow through the melody and it vamps to a fade out with Bergonzi still blowing little echoes of Coltrane as it goes uh, too low to hear any more. So Barada's got it all going on as a drummer, driving grooves, super soft textures, swing and Latin feels. My ears are always drawn to his cymbals and then I notice the creative detail for his fills and changing things up throughout tunes. The idea is great to focus on some of these neglected original compositions by jazz greats, and everyone sounds inspired. The album's a great showcase for David Kokoski, one of my favorite piano players, if you yeah, can't tell too, by now. now. Yeah. And uh, Barata gives him big stretches of solo time to really open up and develop things. Of course, impeccable bass, as always, from John Patitucci on grooves and solos, with some nice electric work on here as well. And Bergonzi sounds great and strong on tenor, like always, especially on the final Coltrane-inspired tune. Rossman's percussion gives nice extra spice on the Latin grooves. It's a really exciting and satisfying recording. Yeah, absolutely. I was really excited 
by this album when I uh, heard it. In fact, uh, the the ensemble playing was outstanding, as were the solos. Um, there's a great anticipation of each other's ideas, uh, which is often accented, uh, demonstrated via drum accents. Like sometimes, like the drums will come in to show that oh, I heard that, you know, kind of just kind of imitating yeah. a certain rhythmic pattern that the uh, soloist has made. I really enjoyed that, the communication, tight ensemble throughout. And of course, you know, David Kikoski, we're both fans of him. So uh, always great to uh, hear him. He's right on top of the fastest rhythms and tempos, oh, yeah. too. And just with all these ideas, Barata has excellent chops behind the drums. He does, yeah. Yeah, and hyper awareness of what's happening in solos via his interjections and imitations. So this whole album just interlocked really, really well. It's got great sound, excellent playing throughout. Three of the nine tracks fade out, and that drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's where they faded out, too. They were all on solos, you know? So right. I don't know what happened after that, but still. If I were elected president of music, <laughs> president of world music, <laughs> I would outlaw fading out a jazz so track. It just wouldn't be legal. <laughs> you got to come up with an ending. It's okay pop music because you, you're kind of... It's more of a produced kind of music. It's mm. you know made made in the studio, not really in the uh, the live yeah. space. So I don't know. I feel like jazz should, a jazz track should um, end right. <laughs> and not fade out, especially during a great solo. Anyway. Anyway, Richard Barata, we're glad you came back to music. Yeah, I'm sure only a small fraction of people will be listening to your music compared to all the movies that you produced. <laughs> not, if, not if we have anything to say yeah, about it. Yeah, not if we could help it. But I'm really happy uh, with these recordings. I think this is a really great recording. Uh, I've listened to the last film one, which I enjoyed too. And I'd be yeah, really interested to see what he does next. If he can collect uh, a group of players like this and have more music like this, that'll be great. So keep them coming. Yeah, this is a great record, really. Yeah. All right, well, that wraps up. This episode, thanks as always to Fast Signs of Staten Island for our glowing neon logo. As we said, uh, we've got uh, new dates scheduled to get together with the Same Difference guys. So we'll get our guest yeah. episode with them, uh, hopefully recorded and then out sometime later in the month. And if you haven't checked out their podcast, please do. The link's at the bottom of the episode description. And after we sign off here, they'll have their little promo at the end that you can listen to. I think they're doing this to build up the excitement because everybody yeah, knows that our audience wants to hear them on the podcast. So there yeah. you go. Could be. Yeah. We'll just, <laughs> just make the anticipation bigger. Yeah. And uh, next week we've got uh, stuff decided. You've got uh, all of one kind of thing going on in class. I've got all right? concertos. Yeah. Hmm. Next week. Cause you, you, you know, so, um, the, um, everybody knows, um, by now, you know, Lars Folkt, the, uh, German pianist died mm. last year. He, um, and uh, there's a new recording of Mozart piano concertos that he made when he was um, actually being treated for the cancer that would eventually right. uh, end his life. So this might be the last. We already heard the Schubert piano trios from earlier in the year. And um, there's this one, too. I don't know which one was recorded later, but um, um, this will be among, if not the last recording we hear right. of him. So I have that. There was a great recording earlier in the year of Nielsen's symphonies, the complete right. symphonies. They were released. Now, that we didn't talk about them on the podcast, first of all, because it's all six symphonies, and second of all, because they were released individually as downloads and then put together into a package, and I didn't really know what to make of that, so we just never right. wound up doing it. Uh, but now there's a new recording by the same forces, uh, Fabio Luisi, and um, what was the orchestra? It was a Danish orchestra, though. Right. And... Um, they did all the the three um, concertos that Nielsen wrote: once for violin, once for flute, and once for clarinet. And I'm not missing this one, so yeah. <laughs> we're going to do this one next week. And then we have um, our contemporary choice is going to be a composer that's well recorded, actually, Kalevi Aho, the Finnish composer, mm. and more concertante works for sort of odd instruments like the accordion, right? The tenor saxophone, and the recorder. Oh, wow. You know, so uh, with the modern orchestra, I guess, so I'm kind of curious to hear what those are going to sound mm. like. And I think I'm going to be sampling them, okay? I'm going to pull out some music samples next okay. week. Yeah, do yeah. it. And on the jazz side, we're going all big band because mm. I had a growing list of cool big band stuff, so we'll get that out. And one of the albums features uh, jazz vocalists, up-and-coming singers, a different one on each track, so that should be fun. See if we hear any voices that we like. And there'll be a lot of good arrangements in there. So some big, bursting, 
brass and big band sounds coming out for next week. Now, if you want to know what all those recordings are exactly and you want to listen to them as soon as possible, like we're going to do starting tomorrow. Yeah, starting can, tomorrow. Uh, Maybe even tonight. Who knows? <laughs> if, I, if I manage to stay up. Yeah, shortly after this episode is published, I'll have that playlist up on Deezer and there'll also be a link to it on Facebook as well if you want to uh, check those recordings out as soon as possible. There you have it. It's been episode 130 of Adult Music. So we'll be uh, back. 130. There you go. With 131 next week and getting closer to our guest episode with the same difference people. A lot to look forward to, Mike. A lot to look forward to. I'm just <laughs> I'm already <laughs> thinking of, hmm, maybe I'll just go to the stereo now and just kind of hear started. one of these recordings, get started for next right. week. That's that's my life, basically, listening to music. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps you out of trouble. I guess. All right. So until next episode, keep listening, and we'll see you again next time. Same difference. Two jazz fans, one jazz standard. A review of a single jazz standard through music, history, and stories. And this is AJ. And this is Johnny. If you are a jazz fan and you like jazz standards, bebop, show tunes, ballads, you name it. Yeah, we've got them here. We drop a new show on you every other week, and we take a standard, and we listen to a few different versions of it. Same difference. Come join the fun. Looking forward to seeing you. <laughs>